first, I'd like to introduce Laura Thomas to talk a little bit about the Nebraska World Affairs Council uh, and maybe even highlight today as Omaha Gives. Yes, welcome and greetings to everyone. Um, this is so exciting. This is our first official international Zoom webinar. So thank you, Dr. Gupta, for, for joining us and kicking this off for us. I, um, as Patrick said, today is Omaha Gives here in Nebraska. And while we are a very new nonprofit that just received our official um, 501c3 documentation, we couldn't enroll officially into the Omaha Gives, but we are fully enrolled with the Omaha Community Foundation for donations um, as we begin to build an exciting program series for the next chapter of the Nebraska World Affairs Council. And for those of you joining, I would just like to read our mission statement and our vision statement so you better understand our goals um, for now and in the future. The mission of the Nebraska World Affairs Council is we are a brand new 501c3 nonprofit we're a nonpartisan educational organization, and together with partners, we're dedicated to providing pathways to broaden and deepen public awareness and understanding of international affairs, engaging Nebraskans of all ages and communities with the world and with each other. And our core values include diversity, inclusion and respect, nonpartisan education on global affairs, collaboration, community development, cross-cultural learning and sharing of ideas, personal and social empowerment and responsibility. So we are grateful to have you all today and we look forward to a very exciting um, growing webinar series during this COVID where many of our events prior were all in person. We're gonna navigate the unknown, um, but it is so exciting that we have the technology to be able to connect locally and globally during this time. So thank you everyone. Thanks so much, Laura. And now I'm going to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Madhakar Gupta. He is additional secretary to the government of India. Uh, he's in, posted in the Department of Public Enterprises and has, among other things in his portfolio, the corporate social responsibility uh, agenda and handles the corporate governance, uh, performance appraisals, um, uh, these these public sector utilities. Uh, as an as a trained engineer, he has a good grasp of all of that. But also a very um, I'm going to say liberal arts education in the best sense of the word. An MBA, a law graduate, a PhD in development economics, um, and then you were actually one of the Mason fellows, both you and your wife, uh, earning your master's in public administration at Harvard University's um, John F. Kennedy School of Government and your master's in public policy from the Maxwell School at Syracuse University, one of the top in the world. Um, you also have interesting experience uh, in posting in the UN, um, doing some emergency management uh, uh, advising there and have done emergency management in in India as well. So a very broad background and I could go on your your CV is is quite extensive but uh, that gives a sense of some of the postings that you've had. I want to start though with a personal question and that is how how are you and how is your family doing? I know you have uh, parents uh, who I actually love to go and, and see every time that I'm in India. Um, how are they all doing now under this lockdown situation that's going on? Well, uh, uh, thanks, Patrick, for your question and also for your genuine concern. Well, it's been very lonely for the last two months. I am holed up in Delhi. My wife and my son, who likes to believe that he's a filmmaker. So he was in Mumbai and he came up a week before uh, India shut down. And they are together in Jaipur, whereas my daughter, as you mentioned earlier, she's in uh, Chicago. And the moment I get up in the morning, the first thing that I do is 
do a reality check of what's going on on the corona front in chicago in the us in jaipur in delhi you know to be aware of what's going on at a personal level then i also have my i'm fortunate to have my father who is around 88 and he is electrical engineer and my mother who's got 85 so for their sake i thought it would be better to be around and i try and spend some time with them every evening so and as all of us are aware, are aware that people in the older age group are more susceptible and uh, you know they, they they really need to be isolated from uh, external influences so it's been tough it's been uh, eerie uh, delhi roads are full of people greater delhi has a population of 25 million and uh, you hardly see people on the roads uh, it's 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 been very unusual times so as a family we try to stick together we can talk to each other within india outside india a cousin of mine he got infected by corona he mm-hmm. and his father and also his uh, daughter so that was a bit scary uh, fortunately the morbidity rates in india are much lower they are about 3 to 100 corona patients they are even lower i don't know how much of credit we can we can take uh, the government of india can take but then the morbidity rates are lower even in like bangladesh or in africa so the 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 turf is very very different you know it has impacted corona has impacted people in different parts of the world they obviously they have different levels of immunity against corona uh, one one thought was that those regions of the world which are endemically impacted by malaria uh, have resistance to corona i'm not an expert on corona or on uh, you know on medical sciences but then there is some correlation and even in india it has impacted different parts of india differently kerala tamil nadu have a morbidity of less than 1% globally if we see south korea is well germany they have handled this uh virus much much more efficiently so to say so take the turf is different different countries have handled the situation differently uh the, the the at a family level if you ask me my daughter has been trying different recipes sitting there she's been calling her mom she's been going online and trying in the she's vegetarian so she's she's been trying different dishes american mexican indian uh so and those of us who had forgotten to cook have again you know moved back to our culinary skills after two months today i had some ethnic indian sweets and it was fun you know having those sweets after two months so practically you find all the confectionery shops going out of business so you are left to fend for yourself and those of us who were used to going to office every day so what do you do there have been a lot of issues between families between husband and wife between children it's been tough to manage children and also my my niece has three young boys and she they've been finding it very tough to handle those boys because they have so much that like by his mother in law daughter in law interesting dynamics so yeah. what one yeah. one There's a lot of Bollywood <laughs> movies about that dynamic so uh uh I w- I won't go there. Uh thankfully I have great great relations with my own uh, mother-in-law but and and my wife does with with my mother who's on the line right now too. So um let me ask you about those shops that have been closed and uh we're we're seeing the same thing here in the US but uh how how, how is India's economy going to start back up? 
once the lockdown is lifted, which I, I guess is going to be May 30th, right? Uh, after that, how does the economy start back up? I think now the government of India it has allowed the provinces to take certain decisions in a decentralized fashion because uh, you know while one size fits all is not possible in a huge country like India. For example, daily today the shops have opened, so except for the so-called red red zones, so shops, business establishments have opened up, offices also are functioning with lesser strength. Basic issue was transportation. How do you bring people to office? How do you bring people to workplace? Metro was not functioning. The local uh, buses, the local transportation was not working. Auto, uh, autos, cabs, Ola, Uber, they were not functional. So now, now things are getting back on track. But then the issue remains, you know, if you see the graph, of the growth of Corona in India, it's practically exponential. And uh, you know, if 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 community transmission starts in a big way, then possibly it it would have been very difficult to handle. So to that extent, we can we can claim that we handled Corona fairly well. Uh, the casualty. The known figures are 3,000 odd in the whole country of India's size, but then economy is going to be a big worry. It's we don't have firm data. Migrant workers who work in different parts of India, especially the metros, but a rough estimate is about 20 million. Now, how do you get 20 million back to work and when? Mm. One way of providing sustenance to them is through Narega, so that they work as wage laborers on different developmental programs within their own community. So the, 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 the provisions and the policies say that you have to initiate community development work close to the place of residence of people who want work. So rather than provide doles, to put people to work but then the whole issue of return on investment on Narega workers, we also need to works in this country. So just just to just to give a little bit of context there, uh, Enrega is the the government scheme, the government uh, program that is creating jobs in the rural areas for uh, some some of the rural people. Uh, but as you just said, that return on investment question, I've heard many critiques that you know they're they're, they're digging a ditch and then they're they're filling in the ditch, <laughs> and it's like you know just creating work just for for work's sake. We're, we're asking some of the same questions about infrastructure uh, redevelopment here, and and what we can do to 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 have some 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 you know some return on investment for uh, some of the the money, the stimulus money. Um, how much money is going to uh, to the stimulus in, in India? Uh, what is the the money, and how what is that money going to go for once the economy opens back up? So the economic package, which has been uh declared by the government of India is something close to 3.7 billion dollars. Uh, a lot of it goes for incentives for the small and medium enterprises. Also, remission of loans. So it has, it has many parts to it. Uh, some kind of cash transfers also will take place to farmers or to the but where the rubber hits the road, eventually we have to put people to productive work. So they have to create value in the economy and they have to create wealth through goods and services in the economy. One, one sure bet in the Indian scenario is that we focus on savings. Our economy also has grown because of savings. Indian economy was driven by savings. 
in addition to growing demand. So initially we focused on savings. So we we'll again have to go back to savings. So we save what we we save the maximum that we earn and deploy it, invest it in ways which are more productive. Yes, demand will will take a hit. Marriages, gatherings, uh, events, dispensable, expendable expenditure will go down. Mm -hmm. So, luxury, travel, tourism, conferences, etc., mm -hmm. etc., will mm -hmm. go down. So, so people are going to cut down on things, fine dining, hospitality. So, so people will basically care more about their basic. Today, a, a, a major question which is on the minds of wage laborers, also their service providers, you know, their employers, is how to pay their wages. They haven't, they haven't earned for the last two months, and they are expected to pay the full wage to mm -hmm. these workers. But how? And many of them have thrown their hands up and they say that it's just not possible. So possibly the workers will have to take a part of the hit. So some haircut has to be passed on to the workers also, in addition to the employers. Mm -hmm. So the, even if even if employers want to pay, how do they pay when they have no resources? So I'm starting. I'm starting to see a, f a few questions uh, uh, coming in. Um, one uh, from Warren Hill, one of our our board members, uh, are the skies cleaner? And I saw that Kieran said uh, that there's less carbon emissions. Um, and so yes, the skies are clearer. I also saw a picture of. Um, of the Ganges River, uh, which is also uh, actually one of my friends in Varanasi, uh, Dr. Padilla, who you've met, um, said that the Mother Ganga is cleaning herself. So by by just having you know the the, the flow of the river, uh, there, there there's a lot less pollution. Um, so uh, another question. Oh, th thank you, Kieran, for clarifying National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. That's Enraga. Um, that 20 lakh crores package uh, is somewhere around $300 billion. Is that, is that what, we, what, what we thought before, Madhikar, you and I were talking? At, at three, somewhere close to $300 billion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the USA, many people are talking about uh, and worried about um, economic devastation and also the expansion of authoritarian government policies. Are you having some similar concerns in India? Asks my friend, John. Uh, it's a difficult question. It's a tough question to answer. But then there are different thought processes, different messages, different kinds of articles being written in the media. Uh, even even the lockdown, you know, for example, the leftist government in West Bengal has been very critical of what the federal government has been telling them. Likewise, the leftist government in Kerala. So, so they didn't want to be dictated by the federal government. So finally, eventually, the federal government said, well, you take a call on what, how you want to dilute, how, how do you want to dismantle the lockdown. But there is, there could be, uh, it, it, there could be temptations for any government to be more uh, invasive, to be more intrusive into the space of citizens in, in India or elsewhere. Uh, at the same time, uh, when the chips are down, you hear different noises. So you also, that also could prevent government from, from becoming very, uh, you know, complex scenario to say. Because in a commanding position, you can you can have more power. But when the economy is not doing well, then you are in a, when you are pushed to the wall, 
So I think I think it will be a tough call for those people in government who want to arrogate power more power to them. So I think I think we 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 need to be more humble and more democratic. Uh, and engage with the people on the ground much more than earlier because there has to be concerted effort, and not only in one country or not only in India at a global level. So people, the biggest thing which I've seen in disasters or in emergencies is you see humanity against nature. So. When when I went to the Gujarat earthquake, I was working with the UN Development Program, and they put me down on the first day as their team leader. You see humanity here. Often I would come across people I can't speak their language, but then you you work with them. You know you 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 speak a global language. So the entire humanity has to work towards global revival, so to say. Because it's going to be a really difficult, you know. For example, my my father he said something very profound. He said, "I could never think that something like Corona will happen in my lifetime." So out of the blue, something has happened. We were not prepared for it. So this is the time not to not for hair splitting, not to find fault with each other, but to sit down and find solutions to problems and help each other. This is a, a great call to action, and I appreciate your 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 saying that. Let me ask. Um, and my heart, Patrick, my heart yeah. goes out to your colleague who who's trying to raise funds for Omaha for mm. you know, to mm. help people uh, in in this in in this difficult time. Uh, so, thank you. People are having similar situations across the world. Yeah. What is what has been your uh, your experience, think, thinking about just the humanity of it, and 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 some of the we, we've heard this is the biggest lockdown in human history. What's happening in India today? Um, what have you seen in terms of people either, you know, following the rules, or may, may, maybe you've you've been in Delhi and you've seen some some things that haven't necessarily followed the rules. Tell us tell us about those experiences. No, initially initially they were defined. Initially. People were defined. They would fight with the police. They would fight, fight with the law enforcers. But after a few incidents, when people realized that the threat was real, Corona was there to stay. Corona was mm-hmm. real. Today, mm-hmm. I've often seen when I tell people that, "Can I come and see you? Say hello to you?" They said, "No, I think we'll wait." So mm-hmm. people are it's very scared mm-hmm. to meet each other. Even neighbors are scared. Now the police is just sitting and sipping tea and tea or coffee, so people realize that it's a real threat. So law enforcement, to, to that extent, the need to enforce law has come down substantially. As somebody who's been working with the government or governmental agencies for a long time, so I have seen this shift. Uh, I, I I think. I think uh, we people are hopeful, and I don't know. I would still feel what the U.S. has done. They have not locked down their country totally. They have still tried to, you know, uh, they have still tried to find ways and means to figure out how they can keep their economy running. I still. Think that it was a smart move on the part of the U.S. People can agree and disagree, mm-hmm. but yes, where you find the incidents, you know, impacting a lot of lives, yes, you you have to take the call. But then there are there are states like California which have handled Corona fairly well. So there 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 could be high, there could be a difference of views, but then I I would still feel that. As people have been saying, life and lives. So you have to balance between mm. life and lives. So you, once the economy goes down, it takes a while for the economy to get revived. Yeah. So, so my sense is, at least it will take six months to one year to get back on rails, mm. and it's not easy. And to what extent? So, 
it's it's a tough question, and uh, I think all of us will have to put our best foot forward. People are trying to find answers which they may not have now, but we'll cross the bridges when they come. I think Corona we're, also. We're, we're struggling with the same thing here, here, here in the U.S. Trying to find answers about when, what's safe. You know, what is the the uh, is the curve flattening? All of that. Um, I want to open it up to some other questions. Um, Warren, you ask, uh, I see your COVID numbers in India are stabilizing. Um, is there a serious issue with under-reporting? Now, this is one thing that, that, that we also have dealt with here, that because people are not being tested at the levels, um, then they're probably under-reporting the actual incidents. Do you think the same thing is happening in India? I think as an administrator, what I've seen is if somebody has a problem, he will not keep quiet. If somebody is sick, if, some, if somebody is impacted by corona, he or she is not going to keep quiet about it. Mm. So reporting, under-reporting, I don't think they are ma major issues. Anybody who's sick will report. Mm. Also, there's not much you can do about corona. If 97% people are getting well, like other viruses, you know, it is people get cured over time. Mm -hmm. So, so I would I would put too much of premium on testing. Testing mm -hmm. also, you know, situations in Europe are different. Situation in US is different. See the first element of testing: over zealousness in testing. There's a big, big lobby which wants to buy medical equipment, spend on medical equipment. I would be more focused on on treating these patients. So, so, so I, I wouldn't go overboard in testing people, uh, or I would feel. I, I, I won't I won't spend much time on issues of reporting or under reporting. Okay. I okay. Feel that people who are impacted will will obviously report that they're not right. So I would find figures fairly accurate about corona patients even in India. Yeah. So there, there is no reason to disbelieve the figures which are coming out. Kieran has also uh, added here. Uh, many are symptomatic patients, right? Uh, awareness is low. Infrastructure in India is limited. Um, testing facilities have to be expanded. So, uh, uh, thank you, Kieran, for that. Uh, for weighing in on that, this is one thing that that a lot of us at the beginning of the lockdown were watching the um, especially urban poor going back to their villages and thinking if they're taking coronavirus back to the villages, the, the rural health system is going to be overwhelmed if the cases go up too much. And luckily, I don't think I've seen as much reports of that, but I don't know what, what the, the reality is now. Um, I want to open up to any other questions that people have as well. I think I'll just, I'll just, yeah, please do, please. I'll just mention one thing. Hmm. Uh, you know, uh, as an administrator, 80, in 1988, we got a busload of women infected by AIDS from Mumbai to the district where I was working in Tamil Nadu. And at that time, people thought it was con contagious. Nobody wanted to come near to these women. And we had to find our own paradigm, how to handle this one, and tell people that, well, it is not contagious. So also, there is a certain element of stigma attached to these patients. The moment the family members themselves get to know that somebody is, a, is infected by corona, their behavior changes. Mm. And obviously, the, the behavior of neighbors, other people in the community. There are stories of people getting back to villages and their own kith and kin back in villages refusing to let them in into the villages. Mm -hmm. So those kind of things also are happening. So we, 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 we hide, the media hide, the, the element of fear which has been driven into the minds of people across the world associated with corona. I think we need to work on that. Yeah. I think that fear and stigma is a, is a big issue. Uh, 
Dr. Chambers, um, you, you sent me a, a message about um, the economy opening back up uh, based on some recent studies of Holland and Sweden. I'm not as familiar with that. Do you want to uh, ask that question yourself, please? Sure. There was a Holland uh, has a big lockdown like India, and Sweden, of course, has remained fairly open. Yet, if you look at the decrease in the economies, while Holland has more, it was 29%, but Sweden was 24 So the question is, even if you open up, people have to come out. And the question is, will they? Hmm. That the point of the article was governments don't kill the economies, the virus is killing it. Well, the fear, right? The people who aren't right. out it's because the of the fear. fear of the virus mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's killed. And I'm just curious what he thinks about India. That very interesting study between the Netherlands and Sweden. Hmm. Well, uh, you know, we've been we've been watching what's been going on in Europe also, and I've spoken to a, quite a few expats living in the U.S. and also in Europe. For example, I called up one of my friends in Vienna. In Italy. So Italy also, you know, they had some hot spots like Milan. Likewise in other parts of the world. Well, if in any, in any disease, if you have a morbidity of less than 1%, I think that is tolerable. You know, as an administrator, I would, I would feel comfortable opening up the economy. I would really focus on how we handle the patients, how we handle the triggers, how we handle the transmission of this disease from one end to the other end. And at the same time, those people who are affected by corona, what quality of treatment do we give them? At the same time, open up the economy in a limited way, progressive way, to the extent possible, because there's no guarantee how long corona is going to continue. And I would feel that, you know, we don't need to be overconfident, but then having learned in these two months, how Corona has kind of panned out in India, we need to grapple with it. We need to fight it out. We need to limit it, contain it, and find ways to revive the economy and also to drive the fear of Corona out of the minds of people in India and outside India. Thank you. Other questions, please? I'll ask again about the uh, the urban slums and having spent a lot of time in India, I know that social distancing is nearly impossible, and some of the the basic issues like hand washing that we're that we're hearing about uh, are very difficult in in some of these areas H How do you see this uh, coronavirus? playing out in some of those areas where there is, you know, difficult health disparities and uh, difficult living conditions? I think, I think what Corona has really underlined is the need to be more hydrated. So this is something which people at the lowest level of the economy or society have now started understanding. So this is one of the positives of this situation. So post-corona also, people will learn to be more hydrated. You know, we had this infamous plague in uh, Surat, one of the textile hubs in Western India. After the plague, things really improved dramatically. So people, once people have a real, a real taste of what's going on, I think, I think, I think they will, they will, they will remember the lesson for a long time to come. And once habits get reversed, people tend to continue with 
the reverse happens. So once they are taught to wash hands or to be more hygienic, I think I think things things will be better. Can you just give me one second? This is yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I I'm going to uh I'm going to ask Kieran, you are you are in Jaipur yes. now, right? And yeah. what is what is the difference in your experience seeing uh, the lockdown and the coronavirus in Jaipur versus what you were experiencing when you were in Delhi? I think it's uh, quite different how the metropolis and the smaller towns have reacted. Well, Jaipur is a red zone, part of it, particularly the walled city because of many factors, the number of houses, the density of population is very high. But in rest of Jaipur, uh, the closure has been quite effective. It's opening up now gradually little and some of the units have started functioning. Some of the shops have uh, opened up. Our government offices started functioning from last 20th, of course, with one third of staff. Now we are there. We call only people who are urgent. But yes, school, colleges, malls, restaurants, everything, transport, everything else is closed. Mm -hmm. People have complied with it. And uh, although the numbers are increasing, it is a matter of concern. Yet, globally, when you compare it with other countries, India seems to have done better, claiming a better recovery rate with lesser death rates but i think we need to go a long way both in terms of building up the systems of hygiene and also continuing social distancing because covid 19 is something which i feel the cure is not very close even if we get to a vaccine or a medicine prescription the production to cater to the entire world is going to take long Mm -hmm. By the time it comes to India, uh, it'll be, it will take some time, even after we are successful in that. Mm -hmm. But in metropolis places like Bombay, which is hit very hard, and uh, Gujarat is bad, Chennai is bad. Um, those states, I think, where again, you know, a lot of migrant labor is there. There's a floating population. It's almost like New York. And it's a financial capital. It is, it is bad. I think when we went into lockdown, there was very little anticipation about how the migrant labor is going to behave. Because when panic strikes and they run out of money, they run out of their wages, they run out of work, they wanted to get back home. Although many, uh, you know, special trains have started, special transportation is there, but we have reports of many of the laborers even sitting journey on foot for thousands of kilometers, mm. which was humanly almost impossible. Mm. So I think that was uh, quite a concern which has touched us all. And, uh, but still where one is, one is, and we have to... Uh, you know, learn to cope with this crisis. We have to help each other. We have to see how life, we can function with minimum of our resources mm -hmm. and how we make this world sustainable. Yes, some good lessons we have learned from COVID. For example, being at home, there has been a greater social bonding, greater family bonding, although the families which are spread like ours, we meet on Zoom. Uh, but still, nevertheless, homemade foods. I don't think so. Children uh, thought they would live without outside food. But now, yes, homemade sweets, homemade food, everything, and with limited resources. And even grocery shopping is only what you need. And planning your time. I think these are some of the things. And then plus you have plenty of time. We were earlier moving in a very fast world where we always said to ourselves, oh, we don't have time for many activities. And now that we have time, it was time to hone your skills or to pick up new skills, 
Vishnu has started cooking, I would say. Oh, I want to I wanna taste some of Vishnu's food. And I hope you're painting because I actually have on, on my shelf right here, I have one of your paintings right there. Oh, how nice. I'm so glad to see that. I'm so glad. <laughs> well, let me ask a couple of other questions that... Um, that are coming in here. Uh, one from uh, Akil, who is one of our incoming MBA students here at, uh, at UNO. We look forward to welcoming you. Um, Akil asks, how much estimated growth in India's GDP may we anticipate as a result of the stimulus package announced by the government? Um, I, and, and just to, to make sure that I'm, I'm clarifying the question here, I think that, that GDP has been uh, well, traditionally in the uh, 6% uh, category, but that has dropped some. Um, and I think it's it dropped obviously a lot more uh, now, but what is the estimated growth uh, that's that's coming as a result of the package? Um, Madhukar? Uh, I think it's, again, a very relevant but tough call. Uh, it's tough to kind of spin out numbers, but then there have been years when India has grown at more than 8% of GDP. So it also depends on at what point of curve are you there as far as your developmental story is concerned. You know, how much of infrastructure is already built? Um, what, you know, what what is your developmental story? You know, once the US built its own infrastructure, you can't sustain that rate of GDP, GDP growth. It has to come down. Now, having seen what Corona has done, this package is fairly big. This stimulus package is fairly big. But in addition to the numbers, how we implement this package, how sincerely, you know, I'll give you a very simple example. Access to resources, access to the packet or the concessions or the uh, incentives which have been given in the package. Do people get access to that? How soon or how far? How do we really carry out the implementation of the package? So that's extremely important. How fast? Let us say one and a half months people liquor shops are closed. And many people didn't have enough reserves of liquor. So what poor guys, you know, they were sitting at home and they were also not having access access to liquor. Now once the liquor shops opened up, now the government collects a lot of excise on the basis of the sale of liquor. Moral issues apart. Now, when the liquor shops opened, there were queues. People for, forgot about, you know. I saw, I saw, I saw that. Yeah. Now, now with a cell phone, and if you tell people to book online, everybody cannot use the internet. You know, computer literacy is still limited. You know, people, people at the lower le end of the uh, socioeconomic. Uh, you know, uh, picture. So they, they, but you have cell phones. Everybody knows how to use the cell phone. What prevents you from giving the number of the guy who handles the local liquor vent? You can always call him up, give him your address, and tell him, hey, this is what I want. So keep things very, very simple without complicating. But doing things online still is difficult in a country like India. So we need to simplify and get on with the business. Till such time we don't dispense the incentives in the real spirit in which they have been rolled out, we will not be successful to the extent that we want to. Mm -hmm. So the way we implement this package is extremely important and we need to be innovative. So different states will find different paradigms of implementing this stimulus package, mm -hmm. economic package. Mm -hmm. But then I think I think a lot of challenges remain and the biggest challenge is in how we implement it. 
Got it. So, thank you. Thank you. Let, let, let me let me run through a few more questions here, if it's okay with you. Uh, one, uh, JC, who who was on the line, I think she's still on the line here, um, is one of our star uh, therapists, counselors at uh, at UNO, and we especially thank her. I know Lori Arias, who also is on the line, uh, and and JC have this this tea with JC every week for our international students. And she does such great work for all of our international students and visitors. So I wanna make sure to get to her question here. What can the rest of India and the rest of the world learn from what's happening in the state of Kerala? Patrick, uh, you want me to respond? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that, l let me just say, I think that the, the incidence, the uh, morbidity is, is pretty low in Kerala. Am I right? It is, it is I think, 0.7% or 0.8%. Yeah. Which yeah. is tolerable, which is tolerable. And, uh, you know, basically, we need to keep Corona within tolerable limits. You know, as an administrator, as a practitioner, that's what I feel should be done. Which Kerala has been able to do. Kiran has worked in Kerala. We, we, we need to stick to the basics and do our basic right. And as long as, we, as long as we do our basic right, we'll be fine. Also, there are some questions about, you know, tumors, about therapies, about all kinds of, you know, treatments for corona. Well, all these things are happening in India also. India, everybody feels is, that he's an expert. You have different systems of medicine. So all kinds of self-styled uh, physicians, doctors, quacks, they have come out with different solutions to corona. But I don't think there's a need to buy into what they're saying. But well, there are traditional systems of medicine in India and in this part of the world, which also make a lot of sense. They can be used along with allopathy. So, Kieran, I, 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 I want to highlight the point that, that Kieran just made about Kerala having one of the highest rates of literacy, not only in India, but actually in the world. And, and let me also say, uh, being the father of, of two daughters, it also has some of the highest girls' education and women's literacy rates in the world. And the hygiene levels are high and precautions are being taken. I, I also would say, uh, actually, my wife and I spent uh, last Christmas in Kerala, which was absolutely beautiful. But um, I would say that there also is a trust in government in Kerala. And that actually goes to a question that some other people are asking. Um, there are, are people... Uh, protesting um, from from Kayla Snow, one of our new board members here. Uh, in the U.S., there are some protests by citizens pushing back against government oversight and lockdowns. Has India experienced any behavior like this where citizens are protesting against the government? Um, or have citizens mostly been compliant, you know, trusting that the government is doing the right thing? No, citizens also have protested, especially the lobbies, business lobbies. Business lobbies, you know, uh, uh, big business houses, they have been protesting, chambers of commerce. So people have been thinking, some of them have been very articulate and very aggressive in criticizing what the government has been doing. And, uh, you know, they, they've been saying that it's like throwing the baby with the bathwater. So you can't be locking down your whole economy or your country. Uh, and the projections which were made of the number of people who will be impacted by corona and who will, who, will, who will die because of corona, there's a big difference between the projections and the reality. So, so that again is a pointer to, and also a lot of, Patrick, all of us will agree that a lot of presumptions, a lot of presumptions. There are so many variables, so many externalities. That's, it's, for example, GDP. It's very difficult to put a finger on any number. You know, it's like pulling a pulling a number out of a hat. Mm -hmm. So, so I, th I think people, the the common man, the man on the street, they have not come out in protest. But then, different different business centers, different pressure groups have have protested in their own ways. And the migrants, 
also you know lobbies for the migrants students media activists they also have been protesting because newspapers have not been reaching you know online papers have been coming so those protests to to some extent have been muted mm-hmm. so they have not been able to make more impact than they could have done in normal times let me Michael Adams was one of our board members. Um, has nineteen impacted relations between India and Pakistan as well? Well, relations. between India and Pakistan? I don't think there have been a lot of discussion. I don't think uh, uh, we have seen a lot of collaboration between India and Pakistan over Corona. As as far as the Kashmir border is concerned, we've had frequent uh, exchange of fire between the two countries. A couple of major incidents where uh, some dreaded terrorists owing allegiance to Pakistan was killed by the security forces. In retaliation, we also lost very, very senior personnel in the armed forces. So we thought that there will be a slowdown in the in the uh, hostilities, at least on the Kashmir border, which has not happened. Going by the, uh, it appears to be business as usual. It, it, in fact, some people could say that there has been ex- escalation. or some some people in the armed forces could have thought that it's an opportunity to escalate uh confrontation between the two countries so i don't think there has been a let up in the confrontation as far as the armed forces are concerned in the two borders uh and this discussion has not really taken place over collaboration between India. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be amazing if India and Pakistani scientists could work together on a cure and find the answer in, in, in some kind of a, a joint venture that would solve this problem for the world? And, uh, uh, you know, Indian and Pakistani scientists would be at the, the forefront together. Uh, my, my dream. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, Thanks. Go ahead, go ahead. Maybe one day, you know, maybe one day. A lot of, it's, it's like an artificial wall in a house, you know. Family living in one house and suddenly you have an artificial wall in the house. It's like that, you know. But East and West Germany, South and North Korea, or whatever. But then uh, things harden, you know, attitudes harden over time. Mm-hmm. So, you never know you never know but then there is there is a lot of affinity as far as the people are concerned between india and pakistan yeah yeah a lot of affinity is there i i i don't know that that you have any insight into this because it's more a uh, a question to, to an american diplomat if you will but um students like akil who are um who are coming to the united states to study uh and he would be starting in august um is seeking a visa uh right now for um a student visa to come and study at UNO uh i i really hope that we're able to to get him here um and maybe not to to put her on the spot but naraini is also uh here on a student visa and um going for you know this this uh a job and such so do you have any insights into what's happening with visas for indians who want to come to the us or want to stay in the us you want that i need to respond or me to respond uh if you if you have any insights akil i know your 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 experience because you and i shared this is that the um the visa section of the us embassy is shut down right now uh in new delhi so you can't you literally cannot go to get it uh, for an interview am, am i am i right about that akil 
Yes, absolutely correct. That's absolutely correct. Right now, all the routine, regular visa appointments have been suspended at the U.S. consulate in New Delhi, and uh, until further notice. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, we are all waiting to for that to open up again so that uh, we can schedule visa interview appointments and then you know do it accordingly. Yeah. Yeah. We have a, just a few minutes left in our in our time, and I wonder, uh, Madakar, if you could just share any last words for us. Um, any I advice? On, the, you would on this on this issue of visas, yes. I think it will be a sad day if you know the number of people. Education has to be encouraged globally, and the moment U.S. is from whatever we saw as a family in two years that, that we spent in the U.S. Our sense is that U.S. is U.S. today because of high quality education, which is given in its colleges and universities. And you guys are fairly open about it. If you want to restrict education and not letting people who want to come to U.S. for education, I think that will be, that will be a sad day if it happens. Thank you. You 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 are preaching to the choir here, as we say. Uh, I totally agree with you, one hundred percent. But I also work in education, so and work in international education. So this is very much in my in my ballpark. Let me say um, one one thing before I give you the final word, and that is uh, thank you for the insights that you've already given to us. Uh, thank you for for what you've shared. Do you have any last I'm going to say advice for America from your own experience in India. What would you say to us about how either to deal with this coronavirus or to do a better job at the economic recovery that is to follow? Any advice? It's very tough to give advice from a distance, but then I would say that we have to handle both the economy as well as the treatment of patients suffering from corona, isolate them uh, to the extent possible and step up the kind of medical facilities that you can step up uh, to handle corona in such large numbers. At the same time, you know, you can't let go of the economy because as I said earlier, a lot of articles have been coming where they have been talking about life, the conflict between life and life. So both both are important. Life is also important at the same time. Life is also important. But the, the good thing is that we see the flattening of the curve in the U.S. What was happening in New York, New Jersey has come down. Uh, so hopefully, but then, but then I would still feel that U.S. has done a great job in handling a tough situation where Americans didn't have immunity to, a, to something. Uh, to, a, to a virus which erupted, you know, which surfaced suddenly. So I would still feel that within the constraints, you have done a good job. Thank you. I appreciate that. And let me say, just on a personal note, uh, that um, global partnerships happen when people can connect across distance. Uh, I feel even though we're far apart, we're still connected, uh, whether it's through Zoom or, um, you know, WhatsApp or, or all of these other technologies. Uh, but I also feel very close to you and to your family. Um, I look forward to the day that I am there in your home uh, once again in the not too distant future. Thank you for being with us today, Madakar. And to Kieran, who's also uh, uh, weighed in here quite a bit. Um, Akil, I hope I didn't put you on the spot too much there, but uh, appreciate your, your inputs too. Sure, yeah, thanks. Well, thanks, Patrick, for having all of us. Uh, Thank you here. all. And, uh, look forward to having you here in India and look forward to continuing our discussion uh, post corona and wish you the best, wish America the best to be able to get out of this situation as early as possible. 